That's one of my favorite things to do, somebody. I love baby dedications. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 30 is where we're going to go. Uh, we've had fun so far today. Uh, anybody happy to be at the Hill this morning? Come on. Come on, man. We're pumped y'all with us today. If you've got your uh, Bible, Ziklag, we're, we're continuing a series called We're That Church. And um, I, I did it last week, but I was just in Bolivar. And so this is your first week of a two-part series. So uh, it's like walking on the end of a movie. Uh, but it's okay. You didn't miss, you missed a lot, but it was great service here. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, it's 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now, Ziklag is one of my favorite stories. I, I'm not going to preach where I would usually preach. I'm going to go to the end of the story of Ziklag. But here's what's going on. David, um, of course, you know who King David David was. This is before he was king, but after he fought the lion and the bear and Goliath, and now he's running. He's on the run, and King Saul's trying to kill him, and, and, and he's going through everything he's going through. And so he goes to fight. He's a mercenary for the Philistines. He goes to fight with the Philistines against Israel. Now, the Philistine kings look at him, and they're going, know about this. I'm not really sure that, you know, the bottom line is that he's an awesome warrior, awesome mercenary, but he's still a Hebrew and we're fighting the Hebrews and we just, I just don't think this is going to work out well for us. So David, you and your men go home. So David marches his then 600 men back to Ziklag. Now, as they get close to Ziklag, the Amalekites have raided the city. They've burned it with fire. They took the, the, the warriors, they took the warriors' wives and, and, and that's, that's a bummer, right? Some of you guys are like, well, that could be okay. No, it's not. It's a bummer, okay? They took the, the wives, they took the warrior's children, and they took the warrior's stuff, right? They took the, the men's stuff. And so in one foul swoop, it's showing us that the enemy is coming, of course, to kill, steal, and destroy. But what he specifically wants to take is he wants to ruin your relationships, he wants to ruin your future or your children. Come on, somebody. And he wants to ruin your stability. Come on, amen. He wants to ruin the things that God has for you. And so he takes all that, the Amalekites take all that, and, and good to see you, Pastor Mark. And they burn the entire city down with fire. Now, the, 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 the Hebrews show up, and they smell smoke, and they see smoke, and they're going... This isn't good. So they get there. Now, the very guys that were fighting with David, they're all mad. They're angry, of course, as you would be. And they're depressed and they don't know what to do. And, and it says they turn on him. And now they're talking about stoning David. That's interesting because the very people David thought for sure they had his back, now they're about to stab him in the back. Am I talking to anybody in the crowd that knows what I'm talking about there? You, you feel like for sure this person's got you or that person's got you. And then you wake up one day and you realize you feel totally and utterly helpless and alone and ain't nobody supporting you. That's where David's at. And, and maybe he went to what was left of his house and it says, this is my, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And it says, and David inquired of the the Lord. Um, and, well, maybe it was verse seven, but he says he, <clears throat> excuse me, he encouraged him. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Verse eight, he got to linen ephod and eight. He says he inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue them? Shall I go after this man? I love that he, that he, he it says that he encouraged himself in the Lord because sometime there ain't a pastor in the room. Come on, somebody. Sometime you can't get a hold of the hill group leader. You can't get a hold of the youth or the kids leader, the worship leader. Your friends are gone. Ain't nobody answering their phone. Anybody know what I'm talking talking about. Sometimes it's you and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And you got to know that two is enough. Amen. Come on, somebody. I love that David says here, he says, I don't have no one else to pick me up and lift me up. I ain't got no one to encourage me. So I'm going to sit right back. And I'm going to remind myself of God's goodness. I'm going to remind myself of what he has to say about my life. I'm going to remind myself of what he says about my marriage and about my family. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Verses 9 and 10, here's what it says. We'll go to that. So David set out and 600 men who were with him and they came to the brook of Basur and uh, where those who were, uh, who were left behind stayed. Verse 10, but David pursued, he and 400 men, 200 stayed behind and uh, who were too exhausted to cross the brook of Basur. Now Basur itself in the, the Hebrew there literally means cheerful. 
Now, I find it interesting that we can be in places in our life when we are going through so much turmoil, that we go through so much hell and so much frustration and so much heartache and so much hurt and so much rejection and so much neglect that we get to a place that we are on the edge of breakthrough. We are on the edge of joy, the edge of peace, the edge of hope, and we stop and go, I can't take another step. I find it interesting that these 600 men, 200 of them, were so close to breakthrough, but, but realized they didn't have anything left in the tank to fight. They didn't have anything left to, to take another step or to, to go any further or to cross the brook. And, 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 and matter of fact, they got so focused, y'all, on everything they had lost. They got so, and we do this, right? We get so focused on what we don't have. Like, like you guys know what I mean? Like you get a new truck and you, ha and you love it for six months and then you're going, man, I wish it had leather. Like, y'all, am I the only honest person in the church? It's okay, I'll be honest all by myself, you liars. And so it's the, tru it's the truth of who we are. Like this is our human nature, right? Like if we... If, Vaughn's putting a big stroker in his Corvette and in 10 minutes he's going to wish it was a bigger motor. Like that's just the way a lot of us are built. And so we get so focused on what we don't have or what we, what we lost years ago that we forget what God has promised us. God's looking at him and saying, look, look, you're worried about what you don't have, but you don't realize I have already delivered it back to you in the spirit. You just got to walk it out in the natural. It's so interesting. As a matter of fact, can I pause right there and just let you know, a lot of times we pray, like, we, can, can I pray? God, deliver us. <laughs> Anybody ever pray that? Now, you don't pray it like that. You pray it in your own way, but you're like, God, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Remove me. God, I don't want to deal with that person. Don't kill them, but move them. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And some of you guys may pray the first part of that. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we can't go there. But, but we go through stuff where we're going, God, I, can you just fight this battle for me? God, I don't know. I don't want to face this. Like we go to these places, but God is trying to get us to understand here. The fight brings freedom. We, we want freedom. And I need you to know if you're going to have freedom, there will be a fight. And that fight never stops. In the war of 1812, um, we had already had, uh, I believe it was the War of 1812, we had already had independence from Britain. And um, Britain didn't like that. And so they came back to try to take us captive again. Can I let you know that it doesn't matter what you have faced, the devil never wants you free? If you battle with depression years ago, his heart is to always make you be depressed. Now God came to free us from that. But it doesn't mean it ain't going to try to sneak back up and take you. Right? And so the War of 1812, they're in this fight. And they don't know what they're going to do. And, and this is when they burn the White House down and they, they're burning all of Washington, D.C., right? And, and so it's all under fire and the troops are gone and, and just Britain troops are the British troops are there and the war is going on. And um, I, I heard the story that, that the rain came and that's what put out the, the fire over the White House and in Washington, D.C. A, a, a crazy thunderstorm showed up and put out the fire. And the winds begin to howl and then lightning begin to strike and it began to kill British troops. And then a tornado came through and, and began to wipe out the Britain. It began to hail. And if you were a hail guy back then, that was good. Uh, we got a few of those in the church. And so it began to hail. And this general was riding his horse. And he looked at this woman that was sitting over here. That, that it, she, she was angry looking like someone stole her last chocolate chip cookie. You know, y'all know what I'm talking about. And so he looks at her and he, he rides over to her. And he says, Madam, uh, are storms like this normal in, in this country? And the woman, angry, the angry American woman looked at him and said, she said, no, God reserves these for our enemies. <laughs> come on, come on, somebody. Now, you won't read that, but that is the truth of what happened. Now, it's interesting, guys, that this is how a lot of us feel, though, right? Freedom will always come from the fight, but you're going to have to fight it. Matter of fact, Jesus tells him, God tells him, he said, you'll pursue, you got to do your part, and you'll win. I'll help you do my part. I'll do my, you do your part, I'll do my part. You bring the super, I bring the natural. Together, we do something supernatural. That's what he's showing them. He, he was trying to get them to understand this concept that you got to face it. No, no. He's trying to get them to understand this concept that you got to face it. 
He's trying to get him to understand. He said, listen, you're going to win, but you got to put your faith foot forward. See, it's interesting when the waves are crashing over my boat and my life feels like it's a mess and I feel like I'm freezing, like I don't know what to do. I'm froze. I can't move. Pastor Randy, I have to not walk by sight, but walk by faith. Put my faith foot forward and know that the waters have to be calm or the ground has to be dry or God will do whatever he needs to do to make a way for me to get to where I got to go. Put your faith foot forward. Put your faith foot forward. He says you're going to recover it all. Verse 11 and 12. They get there and they found this Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. And they gave him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of cake and figs and two clusters of raisins. And Anybody else getting hungry? <laughs> Pastor Randy, when I was growing up, about this time... Everyone's thinking about lunch. He'd begin to talk about ham and turkey and, and biscuits and gravy. And I'm just getting you back. Uh, and, so, and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived. For he had not eaten bread or drunk water in three days and in three nights. Notice what they did. What, what did they do? They found this Egyptian, which would have been their enemy. And they could have left him to die. They pick him up. And they say, hey, come with me, follow me, we're going to take care of you. I find it so interesting that they met his immediate needs. See, we're that church, y'all. Come on, somebody. We're that church that says, listen, you, know, you, may be even, you may be different than me. You may not think like me, act like me, look like me, talk like me. Thank God you don't talk like me because I don't ever even stop talking. And, but nevertheless, like, you, you, know, you may not be just like me, but the reality is we are commissioned and called to do what we can do to help one another. Matter of fact, we see David in this setting of scripture. He would just lost everything. You have to understand this. He was going through hell on earth, but there was someone else in need. And he said, before I do anything for me, let's meet this man's needs. And not, did you see what they, they could have gave him bread and water. That seems fair. But they gave the dude figs. You know, someone was in that room going, they're my figs. You know what I mean? Someone was there like, that's not fair. I, I, I picked those grapes. Like those, are, I earned those. But we see David. And his extravagant heart to bless and to give. We see his extravagant heart. And it says that the, the man was revived. Now, I'm going to say something that is, that is counter church culture. Okay? We are not looking for revival. We are revival. We bring revival. Come on, somebody. When we go to the store, it's the heart of God that if someone's in need, we do what we can do to help them get their needs for the day. It's the heart of God that we pray for the sick. That's revival. Revival is not a three-night event that we do. However, deeper conference, Friday night, Saturday, and sa come be a part of that. It's going to be great. But we're not doing that for revival. I love revival services. But this is revival. Revival saying, man, I see you're broken. And I'm going to pick you up in your broken state. I don't need nothing from you. I just want to revive you. Amen. I want to revive you. That's what, he's, that's what he's saying here. Verse 13 is so interesting what it says. It says, and David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And the man said, I'm from Egypt, a servant of the Amalekites. My master left me behind because I was sick. And it's interesting because Amalekite means lapping. Say lapping. Not lapping like a dog laps water up. That's not, it's not lapping. Some of you guys run for fun. I think that's insane, but good for you. People tell me like, man, I went on a three mile jog. I'm like, your car break down? Like, why? But good for you. I think it's awesome. And so anyhow, not lapping like you outran people. Lapping, lapping. The definition of lapping, which is the definition of Malachite, is the rubbing together of two metals. Rubbing together of two metals. That sounds kind of like a Bible verse, doesn't it? As iron sharpens iron, so does one man. Come on, somebody. Now, what's interesting about this is the one man was an Egyptian, right? And he was a servant of the Amalekites. So Egypt would have been the, an enemy of David and of Israel. Um, for their, whole, for their whole past. And the Amalekites were current enemies of Israel. This guy was a double negative. This guy, when he walked in the room, he, just, he was everything David stood for. This Amalekite, Egyptian Amalekite stood against. If I could say it like this in your world, you have that person, when they walk in the room, they just rub you the wrong way. 
Like, it don't matter what they say. Like, they walk in the room, and, and they're like, hey, can I have a cheeseburger, no onions? And, and you're looking at them like, what is wrong with you? Just eat the stupid onions. Why you got to be so dumb? Like, you guys know who I'm talking about. You guys know what I'm saying. Like, we have those people that are just different from us, that truly just kind of rub us the wrong way. They just kind of irritate us. It's interesting because he says, iron sharpens iron. God's showing us in this setting of scripture that he'll use people that aren't like you, that don't like you, to sharpen you. He's saying, I'm going to send some people into your life that you disagree with. You can't stand to be around them. And I'm going to send them not to make you dull, but to sharpen you so that you can be precise and be exactly what and where I want you to be. He's trying to show us some interesting stuff here. Isaiah says that you are God's weapon of his warfare. So he uses people uh, of conflicting lifestyles and conflicting personalities to sharpen you, not to dull you, so that you can penetrate deep into the kingdom of darkness, bringing light everywhere you go. Church, that's revival. That's revival. Someone, someone's new and they say, he shouts a lot. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I yell when I take out the trash. My wife told me, uh, I've told this before, but she told me before, she goes, wait, I was coaching one of Jace's teams and she goes, you can't coach anymore. You don't, you don't coach this age well. <laughs> You're too loud. <laughs> Make them nervous. As iron sharpens iron, so one, so one man sharpens another. It's interesting. He says, he says that they're lapping. It's the rubbing of two metals, which is another word, friction. Now, who, who here likes friction? Oh, good. Okay, a few of us that are just trying to be spiritual. Uh, <laughs> me too. Like, like, I never woke up, I never one time, I never woke up and woke up in, in the morning and thought, hmm, I'm going to see what I can do today to really tick my wife off. That's a good idea. <laughs> you guys ever done that? You're an idiot if you do. I love you in the name of Jesus. Not being mean, but that's dumb. Uh, <laughs> it's, man, what does Proverbs say? It says, better live on a corner of a roof than with a nagging wife. That's what it says. And so I, my, my heart, I'm not, I love my wife. She's back there. She loves me too. I'm not saying that, that I love conflict, but I think we have, or friction, but I think we have to understand that friction is a part of life. Right? Let, let, me, let, me, let me help you out. When you leave here in, in 10, 12 minutes, when you leave here, you're going to ask your wife, husband, you're going to say, where do you want to go eat? And she's going to say, I don't care. And then you're going to go, what about, from the blank, she's going to go, no. What about, now that don't sound good. What about this? I had that six months ago on a Tuesday to go in Guatemala. What about, you want to go home? No, I don't have anything there. <laughs> so you, you look at every restaurant in the state and you decide that you're going on a day of fasting. Um, none of us like friction. Like, honestly, like none of us go, Man, I really hope I have friction with my boss today. See, it's interesting that the, he says he was a servant to the Amalekite. Literally meaning he is a servant of friction. That's, that's so powerful. Because God is showing us here that friction, you don't have to like it, but you have to embrace it. I was talking about, right, anybody, does anybody for real jog? Like, I don't jog. And so, like, I'm not going to jog across this stage, but I'm going to walk at a slow rate of speed across this stage. And so when I walk and I take a step, there's something that's happening. The way my overweight self is, is all going to the ground through the bottom of my foot. And when my foot hits the ground, the bottom of my foot meets the top of the floor, causing friction. And that friction is the very thing that propels me to take another step in the right direction. Now it's interesting because the people and the things that bring friction in your life, you're saying, I don't want the friction. And God's saying without the friction, you'll slip and fall. So I'm going to use that thing you don't want to come into your life, to cause you to take steps in the right direction, to propel you into everything that God has for your life, to make you a better husband to make you a better coach, to make you a better employer or employee, to make you a better dad or a better mom or a better wife. He says, I'm going to use the friction that you hate with all your heart to bless you, to promote you, to push you into the purpose of the promise that I have for your life. Friction is a good thing. 
friction is a good thing. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're building. So I don't, I don't build either. And so I don't run. I don't build. My man card is all found in the fact that I shoot animals for fun. Amen, somebody. And so, and so it's interesting, though, because uh, what, the, the, the way that this is all hold, held together is what? It, it's, with a, it's with a nail. The, the, the nail. You got you. <laughs> Love you. It's with a nail. I mean, if you think about this, a whole bunch of little nail or screw is what is holding this place together. That's terrifying. Especially if I built it, but I didn't, so we're okay. That's what's holding the walls together, the ceiling on the walls, trusses, all that. And you know what holds that nail in the two two by fours? Friction. It's interesting, God is saying, this servant of friction that you are trying to run away from, He's actually the very thing that will take you to your destiny. Matter of fact, not only does he take you to your destiny, the friction that you're, that you're trying to get away from, he says it's the very thing that holds your heart in place. It's the very thing when fear comes. It says, let the peace of God rule your hearts and mind. That's friction. Allow the peace of God to referee, to call things out of bounds or a foul or a penalty on the play. He says, allow friction to hold your heart in place in times when you want to run. Friction. Did you, matter of fact, it's interesting. Whenever, uh, whenever you run, the faster you run. So I don't run fast. So I a lot of friction. But if the, the faster you run, the less friction you're dealing with. Understand this. If you have friction in your marriage or in your job or in your life, the worst thing you could do is nothing, because the friction stays. But if you move forward. For fr friction is propelling you. And the faster you go, the less friction there is. The best thing you could do is as quick as you can move into the perfect will and place that God has for you to be. Yes. Friction. Look at your neighbor and say, friction. No, no, no. Friction. Friction is a, friction is a good thing, y'all. We don't like it. I'm being real. I don't, I don't wake up and, and say, man, I hope I have friction. But I understand the power of friction. See, if you allow faith to deal with your friction, you don't run from it. You run with it into everything that God has. It makes you stronger. It makes you wiser. It makes you more patient. It makes you joyful. It makes you better. Matter of fact, Jesus, when he was in um, Gethsemane, right before he died, Gethsemane itself means place of crushing. It's interesting, friction. Place of crushing. Those places may be the very place you find your purpose that God has for you. Friction. Friction. Pressure. Crushing. It's, it's so amazing that friction God uses to sharpen us. Friction, God uses it to propel us. Friction, God uses it to keep us in the right place. To keep us. David in verses 18 and 19, just real quick. David, it says he goes and he slaughters everybody. <laughs> it's a good movie, right? He goes and he slaughters everybody. He gets all the stuff they had back. He rescued his, all the people's wives, their kids. He rescues everything in this moment. How amazing is that? The Bible says not one hair of a child's head was out of place, which is crazy because my kids hair out of place all the time. And so it's amazing the, the miracles that God did in verses 18 and 19 when 400 took on hundreds. It says that only a few hundred of the Amalekites escaped on camels. Like God brought total deliverance, total redemption, total restoration. God's showing us that it's going to get better. Although it may not be great now. If you'll remain in place. If you, if you won't run from friction, but you'll embrace friction. It may be bad, John 11, but it won't end bad. Because all things work together for those who love God and are called to his purpose. All things. Amen. See, God didn't create it necessarily. He didn't make it happen to you, but he'll use it. Someone's going, but pastor, my relationship just ended. See, Proverbs 6, it says that 
when you catch a thief when he stole from you. He says, don't despise him. But whenever you find him, he has to pay you back sevenfold. Seven's the number of perfection. So he has to, perf every, everything you lost, he has to bring back perfected. And it doesn't stop there, Proverbs 631. It says that he has to give you everything in his home. So now, and I'm not there yet, but now when I feel the enemy attacking me, and I feel the enemy attacking my marriage, and attacking my mind, and attacking my heart, when I recognize it, see there's a season I don't recognize it, and I become a victim, and you become a victim, we start blaming everybody else in the circle, and it's your fault, and it's your fault, and it's my, it ain't my fault, but when we recognize what's really going on, we understand the principle that God was showing us in Proverbs, and the principle that God is showing us in 1 Samuel 30, that, that when I recognize him, when I see the enemy coming, when I, whenever I find him, when I realize it's him doing it, I no longer mourn, but I, the sorrow lasts for the night, joy comes in the morning. I no longer am sorrowful or mourning, but I begin to do a little happy dance. Look at your neighbor, Pharrell got it right, I'm happy. I begin to do just a little bit of a happy dance, because I realize if the enemy's coming, he's pulling a trailer, a U-Haul full of blessing, a U-Haul full of hope, because anything he tries to take from me, when he leaves, he has to leave more on my doorstep step. That's the reality of the word. That's what happened. They, they went after him and they got so much more they could barely carry it. They're walking back in and these guys look at him and they say, you know what? You know what? I, I, they look at David and say, you know, all those jokers that we left, those 200 idiots that wouldn't fight with us, we'll give them their wives back. We'll give them their kids back. We're kicking them out the door. They're no longer welcome to be a part of, of us. The Bible it says that they call them wicked and worthless men came to David and said that. D David, David said, you know what? You're right. We'll give them their wives. We'll give them their kids. But we're going to give them their stuff back. And you know what? We're not just going to give them their stuff back. We're going to give them their share in the spoil. What? Extravagant. If you do it for the Egyptian, why would you not do it? For your brother. Extravagant. Put that up there, verse 24, 26. I think it's interesting what he, what he says here. The, best, the last part of that. So shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. I know that I'm talking to a crowd that's perfect and, and doesn't have any struggle. But I... <laughs> But, but for the guy on the pulpit, it's easy for him to hold on to some baggage. When I was in India, I've shared this story. First time I went to India, I'm walking in with my backpack and I'm walking and this little Indian guy come up and he grabbed my bag. I'm thinking this guy wants to fight. He's trying to steal my bag. And so he grabs my bag and I pull it back from him. And he takes it from me and I pull it back. I'm at the hotel and, he, and I pull, we're kind of having this tug of war. I'm pulling and he's pulling me and I'm pulling and he's pulling me. And I'm sure it was a sight to see. And we're kind of fighting over this bag. And then I came to the conclusion that, that, that he had to take my bag. If I wanted to enter into the hotel, if I wanted to enter into a place of rest, if I wanted to enter into a place of peace, my baggage couldn't come with me. I had to check my baggage at the door. It had to be filtered through a process called the Holy Ghost and anything that could be harmful to anyone in the hotel got taken out anything that I could hurt myself with got taken out and everything was restored to me when I'm done see the problem is we come to the brook of cheerful the brook of joy and we're holding on to our bags we're holding on to hurts that happened a long time ago we, we take the last relationship that hurt us and we carry that baggage and we bring it into the next relationship we deal with the last person that, that, that did, the last friend that didn't treat us right, and then we don't trust the next friend. We're taking our baggage. Matter of fact, when I travel, truth to true story, when I travel, I do not like to, if I don't have to check bags, I think that's a good thing. And so I look ridiculous carrying all these, like, backpacks and little cart things and, you know, in the, in the airport. And it's ridiculous, but I don't like to have to wait for baggage claim. <laughs> the only thing worse then trying to get to your destination carrying your bags is when you get there trying to reclaim your bags. I feel like there's been times in your life and in my life when God trying to bring us victory. He brought us to the destination and we got there and we thought, I'm missing something. And we go back to baggage claim and we remind ourselves of what they did. 
or what should have happened or didn't happen. And we pick our bags back up. It's interesting. He said, I love the heart of God. I love the heart of David. This is the heart of the Samaritan. This is the heart of the kingdom of heaven. David looks at him. He says, they don't have to fight with us to have the reward. Whoa. And notice what David said. He said, they don't have to, they don't have to be in the battle to get the blessing. Can I, can I put this in today's terms? You don't have to win the competition to get the trophy. Now, before you go, what is it? Let me finish this. This is the heart of God. He says, you can do nothing to earn my love. You can do nothing to, to, to earn my favor on your life. I love you that much. I love you that much. But you know what happened over the next days and months? You had a bunch of guys that had the blessing from the battle, carrying their baggage, walking around in total defeat. They have the same reward as everyone else that's got their head held high. They have the same blessing, the same prong, but the difference is their heads are dragging. Let me, let me make it like, it makes sense like this. I love when I play Madden on the, whatever my son has, we play Madden and we win because that's all we do is win, win, win. We like Madden. But you know what? I don't walk around like boasting because I beat, the, we were the whatever Madden greats and we beat the Browns 160 to two. Like we don't, or three, we don't boast about that, right? No. No, I, it was a lot better when I played football and I took the hits and gave the hits. See, God's saying, I, I want to reward you because I love you. I, I want to bless you even if you don't have the battle. But the problem is 200 men, I believe from that point for the rest of their life, walked around defeated. I think that it's possible that God doesn't just want you rewarded. He wants you victorious. That's what the 200 men didn't have. Oh, they had the blessing, but they weren't victors. They weren't victorious. Matter of fact, worship team, come on up. Matter of fact, it's interesting. If we look at David's life, if we back that up several years, maybe 22, 25 years, we come to this place of David and he's on, he's in the field with his sheep and he hears the bleeding of a sheep and he looks and a bear or a lion grab the little sheep and are running away with it. It's so interesting because David then chases the lion, beats the lion. When a few years after that, Goliath shows up. David said, I beat the bear. Goliath ain't got nothing on me. He kills Goliath. The people begin to sing. David's, Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his tens of thousands. Let's make him king. Fast forward to that. We're at Ziklag. He wins in Ziklag. Fast forward to that. He's the king of the nation. And understand the power of what I'm talking about. If David doesn't fight the lion 22 years before he become king, if he doesn't fight the lion, it's possible when Goliath shows up, he don't have the confidence to fight Goliath. And if he doesn't fight Goliath, the people don't believe he could be a king. And if he doesn't, if he's not in the running for king, he never finds himself at Ziklag. If he never finds himself at Ziklag, if he never finds himself in the friction of Ziklag, he never becomes king. There was someone born in David's lineage. Who was that? Jesus. Jesus. It's possible on a spiritual level. If you don't fight the lion that you're facing today, can you make heaven? The reward's the same, whether you fight or not. Whether you use the friction or don't use the friction, the reward's the same, heaven. But it's possible if you don't fight the lion you're facing today, the Messiah will never be born into someone's life. He'll never be revealed into someone's life. He'll never, he'll never be revealed in that addict's life or that man's life or that woman's life or their marriage or his children. See, we feel like the lion is about the sheep and God's going, no, the lion isn't about the sheep. The lion is about the kingdom of heaven. I don't want you just to be rewarded. He's teaching us, I want you to be victorious. Someone said you have to be a good loser. I feel like if you said that, you were a loser. Because the word says, I'm more than a conqueror. 
I don't read where Jesus said, well, I'd just be a good loser. I don't have to like it. I may not always win, but I'm no loser. I may not always beat the lion when I fight him. He may, I may, got, I have some scars in my life to show where the lions got me back. But I ain't afraid of the friction no more. The friction holds my heart in place. The friction propels me. The friction positions me to someday see someone bow their knee and give their life to Jesus Christ. That's what the lion does for you. That's what friction does for you. Guys, you don't have to like it. You don't have to love it. Matter of fact, you can hate it, but embrace it. Because God allows friction to make you better, to make you stronger. He allows friction to promote you. Would you bow your heads all over this place? Before I even give an invitation, God, I want to thank you. I hate it, but I want to thank you for the friction. Because if not for the friction of a lion or a Goliath or a Ziklag, there'd never be a kingdom. And without a kingdom, it's possible that someone may not know you. I understand the friction promotes me to your fullness, promotes us to your fullness. I don't like it anymore. I don't thank you for it. But I rejoice always. Because I know you have my every breath. First and foremost, if you're here right now and you've never asked Jesus into your life, it's a free gift. He died for you. There's not one thing you could do to earn it. There's not one thing you could do that would make him love you any less. He just loves you. It's a free reward. It's a blessing of the battle he fought. And if you need to ask Jesus to forgive you of all your sins and you need to ask him to come into your life today, when I count to three, just stick your hand in the air. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, where you at? Are you here today? Okay, here's my next question. I felt like that would be the case, honestly. My next question is, I feel like today I need to tell someone, it's time to cross the creek. It's time to let friction hold your heart. It's time to let friction propel you. It's time to, to move into cheerful. It's time for you to walk into victory. It's time today for someone to let go of their baggage, to let go of hurt, to let go of frustration, to let go of self-will, to let go of your own desires. It's time to come to a place where we say, I'm checking my baggage so that I can enter into rest. I'm checking my baggage so I can enter into fullness, so I can enter into peace. It's time for some people today to say, I'm letting go of everything, every weight and every sin that so easily entangles me. And I'm going to walk in the fullness of victory. If you're here right now and you just have some baggage, if that's you, just put your hand in the air. Yeah, praise God. Who else? There's a bunch of us. Yeah, there's a bunch of us. My hand's been in the air. This is the third service. And my hand's been in the air every time. If there's if there's anyone else, yeah. Go ahead. And I'm going to ask you to be brave. If that's you, just stand up right where you're sitting. Right where you're sitting. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Right where you're at. We just want to pray with you and believe with you. Yeah, praise God. Praise God. Who else? Who else? We're not standing alone today. We're not doing this alone today. Now, I'm going to ask you to be even braver. I'm going to ask you to make your way to the front of this. See, they had to cross Basur. They had to cross over physically. I'm asking you to make a spiritual move into these altars saying and declaring that you're moving into joy. You're moving into peace. You're moving into hope. You're moving into purpose. You're moving into promise. Now there's people up here. If you're back there, I need you to be like David today and come and pray with these right now.